Hallelujah, Jesus came. Hallelujah, Jesus lives. He lives in me. He lives in you. Hallelujah, Jesus lives. Hallelujah. Tonight we are here again at Christ Disciples Institute School of Christian Studies. We are continuing with a new uh, series of studies, Study 5. Last week we did part one of Study 5. And Study 5 is on the ministry of the word and prayers. Last week we did an introduction to it. Today we are also continuing with the ministry of the word, uh, part one, uh, part two of it. Uh, praise the name of the Lord. And so last week, we started by helping us to understand the scriptures. When we say scriptures and uh, the Bible, what do we really mean? But today we'll be focusing on effective Bible study. In the previous class, we said that there are two major, uh, two key activities of the church, the spiritual activities and the physical activities. And we said in the physical activities, we have the ministry of the word and prayer, the ministry of the word and prayer. And in the physical activities, we have the social welfare and community development. And we say that the ministry of the word and prayer is the major and most important ministry of the church. Every other thing is secondary. And we went ahead to explain to us what the word means. When we say the word, we mean the word of God. We went ahead to explain to us what the word scripture also means. And uh, finally, we looked at Bible study. Looking at why we have to do Bible study, why it is very important. But today, we are getting to number four of the list of what we do under the ministry of the word. And uh, under this uh, part two, we title this Effective Bible Study. You have the Bible, how do you study it? You have understood what it means. If you didn't understand, go back to the previous uh, teaching. Uh, just scroll a little bit and you will see it, listen to it again. If you can't find it, let us know so I can send the link to you so I can find it. So today we are taking Ministry of the Word Part 2. Ministry of the Word Part 2. Study 5 of Christian Studies, Ministry of the Word Part 2. Another part two, we are taking number four, because in the last class we took number one, two, three. So we're taking number four today. Number four of the list of uh, the ministry of the word, we are going to look at preparing for or preparation for effective Bible study. We are, if you have known what the Bible is, we have known what the scripture is, now the Bible study. How am I going to effectively study the Bible? Now, the word of God is the seed. Jesus Christ said the word is the seed. And to plant the seed, you have to prepare the ground. Remember our, tip, our, our first topic tonight under the study is preparation for effective Bible study. I said the word of God is seed. And before you can plant any seed, you need to prepare the ground. If you don't prepare the ground, you may end up producing nothing. Jesus said in the book of Mark chapter 4, verse 3 to 20, the parable of the sower who sowed. When the heart is not a good fertile ground, the seed may not produce anything. So you have to prepare your heart very well so that when you are doing, when you are feeding on the word of God, you can feed well. Like I said before, the word of God is seed. But the word of God is also like food that we eat. It is the food of the spirit and the soul. The body is the physical food. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone. The bread is the physical food for the physical body. But by the word that comes from the mouth of God, which is the word of God, the food for the spirit and the soul. Hallelujah. So it is important to set the table well so that you can eat this food that God has prepared for us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, 
and 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 2, and Hebrew 5, verse 11 to 14, you see where the word of God is described to us as food. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you might grow thereby. I feed you with what? Milk, not with strong food. You see, there's milk and the strong food. That is a, the major solid food. At the childhood level of spirituality, you take the milk of the word. At the maturity stage, you take the solid food. And so you grow thereby. Now, just reading the Bible, so I have the Bible, I'll just read my Bible, and I'll, I don't need anything to, I just want to read my Bible. You will not get anything. You don't just read the Bible. There is a lot in the Bible. Mere Bible knowledge will not produce anything. Or using the Bible for incantation. That's what many people do these days. They just get someplace and they, they quote, like I said last week, return, return, oh, Salama. <laughs> you try to quote one thing, quote one thing, because you want to use it for something. You want to use it for special prayers. Eh? You want to use it for dangerous prayer. You want to use it for selfish reasons. Now, when you want to drink alcohol, you say, you know, Jesus Christ, even, even Jesus Christ turned water into wine. <laughs> you say, Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach, sake. And then, because you want to drink alcohol, Paul did say, take alcohol for your stomach, sake. We even know that alcohol does not help your stomach. So, taking the Bible, just reading it, and picking out things just for selfish reasons will not profit you anything. And it could be very dangerous. Yes. It could be very, very dangerous because the devil knows how to take scripture and take them out of context and give to people for their own destruction. Even when Jesus Christ was tempted in the uh, uh, garden, the devil even had to quote scriptures. For it is written. For it is written. Fall down. Fall down. Angels will catch you because it is written. And so many people have used scripture to mislead many people. And Paul writing says something in 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 15 to 16, Peter quoting Paul said, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave to him. He write the same thing in, in the same way in all his letters. Speaking in them all these things, his letters contain, take note, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand. There are many things in the Bible that are hard to understand. It takes thorough study to understand them. Sometimes not by you. That's why you have to attend Christ Disciples Institute like this. So that you can study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Peter said, Paul's writing are hard, some of them are hard to understand which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures, not only Paul's writings, as they do other scriptures from Genesis to Revelation to their own destruction. So when you begin to twist the scriptures to suit your selfish aim, it will eventually lead to your destruction. So to ensure that the word of God is properly planted in your heart, or that you are properly fed by the word, you need to prepare your mind for effective Bible study. Before you study any area of the Bible that you want to study, these following are very needful. Number one, number one, remove any form of distraction mentally or physically. What are the things that will distract me? You need to separate yourself. This may include a very convenient, quiet place. So I can have a quiet, meditative study. Because you are not coming to just read. You are coming to study. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. John writing said that the Lord called him and said, Come up here and I will show you. Come up here and I will show you. So for you to really study and know something that the scripture is saying, you need to come from where you are to where you ought to be. A place where you can concentrate both mentally and physically and get the word you need. Number two, you have to pray for understanding because you cannot study the scriptures on yourself. It requires the Holy Spirit, the teacher, to guide you in how you study. 
That's why in Psalm chapter 111, verse 119, verse 18, the psalmist writing says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your word. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I may behold what? That I may see wonderful things from your word. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 to 18, Paul writing says, In my prayer, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better, that the eyes of your heart, your understanding, may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. So Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened. I also pray right now that as you listen to me, the eyes of your understanding should be enlightened. So pray for yourself as well. Oh Lord, as I come to study, open my eyes that I may see. Give me understanding that I may live in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Number three, set your mind to know and live by the revelations that will come from the word. Don't just read it and block your mind. When God is planting words into your spirit, you are rejecting them. No. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25, say, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that brings liberty and continues in it, not forgetting what he has had, not just what you have read, what you have had as you are studying, the Spirit of God is speaking, not forgetting what he has had, but doing it. You say, he shall be blessed. In whatever you do. Now, when you do what the Lord asks you to do, based on the word he has spoken to you, you will be blessed doing that. When we walk with the Lord, in the light of his word, what a glory he shares on our way. Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. So set your mind, set to yourself that I will do what the word says. Number four, to help you study very well, you don't just need King James. You need various translations of the Bible so I can understand better. Now, what are translations? Everything you see at the market shelf, they are all translations of the Bible. They are not the Bible. They are the translations of the Bible. In other words, people translated it from the original language and various, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, material that have been written over time so that you can understand it in the present time. So we have the King James Version, we have the New International Version, we have the New Living Translation, we have the, the, uh, the uh, Good News Bible and all that. These are all translations. But I would advise you, for better understanding, have at least three different translations when you study. And I would recommend... King James Version or New International Version, NIV, or the Good News Bible or the NLT. I've mentioned one, two, three, four. Out of these four, take at least two, either King James Version or NIV and Good News Bible or NLT, New Living Translation. Now, the King James Version is a word-for-word -word translation, while the uh, New Living Translation of Good News are thought-for-thought -thought translation. Come to Bible school and learn more about what thought-to-thought -thought and word-for-word -word mean. But I'm just telling you, for those of you who want to develop in your Christian life, this is what you should do in your Bible study. Don't just use King James. King James is not the Bible that God wrote in heaven and threw it on the earth. Eh? It is a translation prepared by the Anglican. The King, King James is the king of England. I think the grandfather of Queen Elizabeth. They are of the Anglican communion and they produced, they translated the Bible in the King James one. The NIV is translated by various denominations put together. You know, so just get together and uh, read and study for yourself. And then number five, 
be spiritually conscious, but get a book to note down the things you'll be learning. I know you are conscious in the spirit. You want to learn. You want to learn. Don't just come to your Bible study without a notebook. Get a notebook and a pen. As the Lord puts ideas into your spirit, put them down so that you don't forget them. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 to 11. On the day I was in the spirit and I heard the voice behind me, like a voice of trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see. Write on a scroll what you see. Seeing here means revelational insight. As God gives you revelational insight, write it. Write it down. I have a lot of notebooks that I have written over the years. From there, I have, I have produced materials as books that people study from. So God will teach you a lot of things that your church may not teach you, that your pastor may not have time to teach you because he's very busy to, you know, for other things, for church growth, you know. So you have that. Go back, sit down, and carefully, you know, study and write it down. Eh? My spirit will say, put it down, put it down, write it down. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Then number six, as you study, believe the word. Believe what God tells you. Resolve to cast away any idea that contradicts the word of God. If there's any other thing you believed before you came to study the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit begins to open your eyes to things, deep things, say, call upon me and I will hear you. And I will show you, you know, what? Great and mighty things that you never knew. There are certain things I never knew before, but during that my time of Bible study, God began to open my eyes. And when I share it with other biblical students or scholars, they begin to say, wow, this is revelation. This is revelation. Nobody has ever had all those things that the Lord has ever revealed to me through the period of the study that have ever doubted it. They all confirm, like scientists will confirm from other scientists, that what they discovered is correct. That is how it has always been. So don't be afraid that God will not reveal you or Satan will come. No, Satan will not come. You have already prayed and you have already created the atmosphere for this wonderful study. The devil will not come. He said, the gate of hell shall not prevail against the church. And you are that church. The gate of hell cannot prevail against you. So take your time. Number seven. After you have finished feeding and eating, thank God for the feeding. And then go to grow in it and then share it with others. One of the ways to make the things you have learned to stay in is not to keep it to yourself. God does not feed you only. He gives you so that you can also share with others. He will bless you and make you a blessing. Whatever God has given to you, there is always some that is to be sown as a seed into someone's life. The Bible says, He that giveth to what? Bread for eating and seed for sowing. Whatever he gives to you contains bread and seed. Locate the seed and sow it. So when you have fed and fed, do not throw them away. Gather them like Jesus Christ did after they finished eating the five loaves of bread and two fish. Gather them so that nothing be lost. When you have a friend come to visit you, instead of doing kokosa, share with that person the thing you have learned that day. And any of your friends that doesn't want to listen to what you are sharing, you just want to do kokosa with you. Tell that your friend, my friend, I think I, I, I have something else to do. You can go home now. Night has come. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, like I said, remove every distraction. Pray for understanding. Set your mind to know and live by the word of God. Use various translations. Get notebooks and pen to write down what the Lord will reveal. As you study, believe the word and change any dogma that is in your head that is not of God. Maybe they have been teaching you that all your life. You should change it instantly. And then finally, you should feed and feed others as well. And then we go to the next thing. Now that you have known how to prepare your heart for Bible study, the next thing is how do I do the study? Method and tools for effective Bible study. Method and tools for effective Bible study. Now, our first goal was, was be to understand what the original or intention, in, the intention of the original writer. Remember that the Bible you read, let me just be plain to you now, was written 
by someone under the inspiration of the Spirit to a specific people in a specific situation. Genesis, Exodus to Malachi. They were not necessarily leading to under the, to us today as it were. But the message that is inherent in them concerns what has been written for us, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible for us is a medium of passing across to us that gospel of Jesus Christ. John said, for this, many things Jesus did, many things God did in the life of many people, many things have been written in the Bible, but what has been done, but what we are looking for is concerning Jesus. Concerning Jesus. So from Genesis to Revelation, we are looking for things that concerns Jesus. However, there may be other things the Holy Spirit can decide to teach you from other things that are not necessarily concerning, that, that, that does not necessarily concern the, uh, the gospel as it will. So when you are reading, you must understand what is the intention of the original writer and then you'll be able to learn. We're going to go to that as we proceed. There are so many things that are involved in studying. So you must make sure that you don't just read like that. There are many methods that we can use to learn and feed ourselves from the scriptures. Now, look at the things that you will put in place while you pick up the, whatever method you want to use to study. Number one, observation. You ask yourself, this thing I'm studying, what does the Bible generally say about it? Or the scripture you are reading, what does it say about this area of my study? Then after which, you ask yourself, what does it mean? What is the meaning of what the Bible has said? You are trying to interpret, that is interpretation. I have seen what is written. I want to know the meaning of what is written. And then number three, application. I want to see how this can be applied to me or how it is relevant in our present time. So no matter the method you want to use that I'm going to list out here, you must make sure that you do these three things after reading what does the Bible say? That is observation. What does the Bible mean? That is interpretation. And then how does the biblical truth apply to my life or to the present day church or our world today? That is application. Now, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, that we should be a workman that needed not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. When I say we, Paul told Timothy that. But you see that I have applied it to myself because it is relevant that just as Timothy was instructed by Paul to study to show himself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Timothy was a Christian and the instruction given to him to help him rightly divide the word of truth is relevant to us today. So if I must receive the word of truth, I must know how to properly interpret it, properly analyze it, properly digest it, so that I don't corrupt it or twist it for my own destruction. All right. Having said that, I'm going to list eight different methods you can use when you want to study the Bible. You have prepared yourself already what methods can be used. Depending on what you want to do, several methods can be relevant to you. Number one method I want to talk about quickly is the book or chronological study. Chronological study is studying the Bible book by book. I do that a lot. You take the book of Genesis, you study everything from Genesis chapter 1 to the last chapter. Don't forget that the Bible was not written in chapters and verses. The Bible was written like that. That is the, the books, as you see, Genesis. Genesis. It is along the line that they began to break it into chapter and verses for better referencing. So when you have your Bible, when you're reading, don't just stop. You know, there, are, there are texts. When I say texts, it means there are ideas that have been presented and that idea ends, another idea begins. So you read the whole idea before you enter into another idea. 
I'm going to tell us when we look at textual study. All right. So in chronological study, you are looking at the Bible from book to book. I take Genesis, I study. I connect it to Exodus and then Leviticus and then Numbers and then Deuteronomy and so on to the, to the book of Revelation. Then I have studied the Bible cover to cover. There is a difference between reading the Bible cover to cover and studying the Bible cover to cover. Many people have read the Bible cover to cover. And I can bet you that most times they are reading their head into the Bible. They are reading their mind to make the Bible to speak to them what their denomination have prepared as dogma. So when they see anything that is said in the scriptures, they bring into their, their for what their church or what their denomination have taught. Let's say, for example, your denomination believes that women should not preach. Women should not preach. So when you begin to read Bible, you begin to see how you can coin it to align with that women should not preach. When you believe that, you know, uh, 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 we should not, uh, that uh, we should not wear long sleeve. Huh? Or we should wear long sleeve. I remember one, one church I used to attend those days, if you don't wear long sleeve, it's bad. I remember we wanted to build a Bible school and we went to the side, that was in 1984, uh, we were there, and then one of the brothers that were trying to build something, he told the general overseer, please sir, because of this work we are doing, can we just wear short sleeve? He said, no, 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 you can fold your long sleeve, but you cannot wear short sleeve, <laughs> that your nakedness be not seen, hallelujah. So whenever there are dogmas in your denomination, they begin to influence the way you see the Bible. I've seen many people say many things that makes me laugh. A bishop was teaching something, and I didn't see anything wrong in what he's teaching because he is bringing the Bible just the way it is. And people say, oh, this bishop is in error. He is out of orthodoxy. And I look at them. What do you mean by orthodoxy? Orthodoxy simply means how you ought to think. Your denomination have patterned the way you should think. Any thinking that is contrary to that pattern, you say it's error. Error is what you do. The truth is the word itself. So the bishop was not saying anything wrong. He was giving the scriptures the way it is. You can give it your own interpretation if you like. But what he is saying was right. Hallelujah. So that is it. The next method you can use in studying the Bible is what we call topical or word study. Topical or word study. Now what I mean by topical or word study. I want to study a topic or a word in the Bible. Let's say salvation. I want to study about salvation. Now we know that the word salvation is not used in the same term or in the same sense all over the Bible. Salvation means deliverance, liberation, rescue. Now you have to understand the sense in which it is being said. When we say salvation in Christ, which is our study one in this uh, school of Christian studies, we know salvation is, is about Jesus Christ saving us through his death and resurrection. But salvation also means deliverance. So when you read a, 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 in the book of Psalms, when the, when the psalm said, the Lord is my salvation, the salvation he's talking about in that context is not the salvation about salvation in Christ Jesus. It is that the Lord is his deliverer. The Lord rescued him from trouble. All right. So when you want to do the study on salvation, generally you have to study it according to how it is given contextually. Contextually. I'm going to explain to us what I mean by contextually in the next point. So you can study on faith. Faith, generally, faith on how it is used, but don't try to take it out of context. Make sure that the idea you are getting is in line with what is written in that context. Let's say somebody is talking about faith, Abraham and Abraham's faith. We want to study about Abraham, the man of faith, Abraham's faith. Now, that faith, you take time to understand the meaning of the word faith, how it is being used, what it is, how it is used, when it was made uh, used as reference for Abraham. I'm going to say they just shall live by faith. What kind of faith is he talking about there? That's why you see people talk about kinds of faiths. I have been, done a study and I've produced different kinds of faith. And one major, two major ones that I talk about is the, the saving faith and the living faith. And I always teach it in the Bible school. 
So you must take the topic or the, the, the word you want to study and study them contextually, systematically, in a way so that you can understand it properly. Now, many people have written many books about faith and everything, and many people have understood what people are saying. You go back and study for yourself. What is the word saying? Remember what I said? Observation, interpretation, and application. Hallelujah. Then, the next one is textual study. Now, I bring you think, uh, uh, the, what I refer to as context again. Let's say uh, you are reading the Bible and Paul was writing about uh, the story of his life. How he got saved and how, you know, uh, from his, God chose him from his mother's womb, the rebuke Christ to him and all that. How he didn't confine with flesh and blood. How he went to Arabia and came back and all that is. You don't just pick the stories out of context. You must read the story according to what he is saying there. Now, you can also bring another idea into it if another in another place, Paul repeated the same stories and added more details. So you must not go out of what he's saying and put your ideas into it. Hallelujah. For example, for example, let's say the Bible says, uh, uh, in the book of Jeremiah 29, level, for I know the thought that I think towards you, the thought of good and not evil, to give you hope and the future. You see, God says He has given us, He knows the thought He thinks towards us to give us hope and the future. That's wonderful. But you have just brought it out of the context. Why did Jeremiah make that statement? Who was he talking to? And on what occasion? That will help to understand what that statement actually means when he says to give you hope and the future. He just said that God is going to give everybody any hope you have, he'll give it to you. That place, they were hoping to go out of Bab land of Babylon. But Jeremiah was telling them that they're going to spend 70 years there so they should relax there, marry, give birth to children, build houses, enjoy, and pray for the city where they are dwelling because in its prosperity they shall prosper. And uh, that God knows that their thought is to go back to Israel, that their hope, he will bring it to pass. So, it is, if you just cut it out and take it, you go out of context. I'll see people say, let us pray that uh, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter this by that, that we shall not be joined together with them in burial. Hallelujah. We shall not be joined together with them in burial. Let's be to pray. The Bible says we shall not, God says we shall not bury, we shall not bury anybody in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> you have taken that scripture out of context. The, the Bible was not saying that you shall not be joined together with them in burial to mean that you shall not conduct funeral. It's actually saying that about the king of Babylon that have died, he said that they will not bury him like they buried others. That would mean that you will not be joined together with them in burial. And that time, and that place you see, they say, concerning the words of my hand, command ye me. Ha! Let us begin to command now. Have you read it in context to know what it means? Is he saying command me or are you saying, or is he saying, are you commanding me? You will know where the punctuations are, where the commands are, and where the full stops are. Now, why I say you should use different translations is that some translation makes make mistake in punctuation, especially King James did that a lot. So when you read it in King James, read it again in Good News or in NIV, you'll be able to get the true picture of what the writer is saying. Don't take this out of context and destroy yourself. Hallelujah. Like say, oh, he is the lily, Jesus is the lily of the valley. He is the king of kings and the lord of lords. That's true. Jesus is the king of kings and the lord of lords. But is Jesus the lily of the valley? Was he ever called lily of the valley? Now you go to the book of Songs of Solomon. You see where the, the, man, the young man there was calling his fiancée the lily of the valley. <laughs> <laughs> and some people decide that Jesus Christ has become their fiancé. So he's not the lily of the valley. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. The bright and morning star, correct. The lily of the valley, out of context. But if you chose to call him lily of the valley, that's your own. But don't say that that is his name. Hallelujah. Now, when you read the scriptures and you say that, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The judgment shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, 
that Prince of Peace. Now, many people attribute that scripture to Jesus Christ. It's not bad, but and they use it as a background to support the doctrine of Trinity. Okay, the, the Godship of Jesus Christ as it were. Now, if you say, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, who gave birth to the child? Who is giving the son? Is the giver of the son superior to the son? <laughs> you see? So, you have to analyze and query certain things before you bring out a doctrine. Don't just create a doctrine and look for scriptures to pack it up. No, let scriptures give you the doctrine and you accept. Don't create and look for something to back it up. It will collapse. So read that scripture in context. There's another place that is written in the Bible. It says, uh, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Hallelujah. His name shall be called what? Emmanuel. <laughs> now, if you look at it, we always refer to Jesus as what? Emmanuel. Because in the book of Matthew, the writer, the, trans, the transcriber of Matthew said that this were written that it must fulfill what was written by Isaiah, that his name shall be called Emmanuel. Now, look at all through the Bible from the book of Matthew to the rest, if they ever call Jesus Emmanuel. But is Jesus Emmanuel? Yes. But is his name Emmanuel? Was never called. His name is Jesus. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. That word Emmanuel is a description of the presence of God in Christ in our midst. God in Christ revealed himself to us. That's why he said God with us. But his name is not Emmanuel. It is what he has done. He is the manifestation of the invisible God. Are you understanding me now? So... <laughs> there are many things, many things that we have taken as powerful, powerful teachings. When we read them in context and read them in trying to understand what the writer is saying, we discover that we have made a blunder. Even the one we call fivefold ministry, we say there are fivefold ministry that God has called and equipped them to. They are the ones that will equip the church. If you read that place in context, read it with good news, read it with NIV, read it with uh, 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 King James. You will discover that it is the gift that God has given to the general church for the benefit of everyone. There are no people that God has called specially to be fivefold ministry and the rest are nothing. And then these ones are to equip. So tomorrow morning I wake up and say, I'm, I'm apostle. Look, I am, I, my own is to equip you to be the minister. I'm not the one to do the ministry. I am we apostles, we prophets, we, 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 you are. No, 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 no. So please read in context. From the whole of Ephesians chapter 4 down and understand what Paul was trying to say so that you don't go and build something. That's what I mean. Textual study. Study the text. What to do about the five virgins in the Bible, the parable of the five virgins, the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, the parable of uh, the woman who lost coin. Read the entire story, get the entire idea. That is what we mean by contextual study. Then we have the analytical study, for example, where you now look at a particular topic so that you can analyze it properly and understand what it is saying. For example, the gift of speaking in tongues that is very rampant today. And many Christians have believed that when the Bible says baptism of the Holy Spirit, it means speaking in tongues. That is not correct. Now, in the book of, I think, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where uh, Paul was talking about prophecy and tongues. You see that most preachers, when they go to that particular passage, they want to teach tongues and encourage everybody to speak tongues. While in context, what Paul was actually emphasizing is prophecy. He said, I wish that everyone should prophesy. Now, we have emphasized on the tongues and everybody is speaking tongues and nobody is prophesying. We are all supposed to prophesy because prophecy edifies the church, but tongues only edify you that is speaking it, except it is what? Interpreted. How many people even interpret these days? All we have is Amen. That's all. How many people interpret it? Even you that is speaking it, do you receive understanding of what you are speaking? When I speak in tongues by the grace of God, as I pray and speak in tongues, I receive an understanding of what I'm saying in my spirit. But I'm speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for you. 
That's why I, I cannot tell people to church. I say, brother, that's what begin to speak in tongues now. Begin to speak in tongues. I cannot say that. If I give a prayer point and you choose to speak in tongues while everybody is praying on their own, that's okay. But for me to say, everybody, open your mouth now, begin to speak in tongues. If you don't know how to speak, I'll teach you. That is nonsense. Read that place in context. Paul was not emphasizing on tongues. His emphasis was on prophecy. But we have left the prophecy and go on tongues. Now, people are pushing people to give them prophecy while they are blasting in tongues, as they call it. God have mercy. So, analytical study will help to understand things like that. Healing, prosperity, or prophecy. You can understand who, prophet, who a prophet is in the New Testament. So, you analyze it properly. Check scriptures that are relevant. I'm going to show you the tools you can use to do that as we conclude tonight. We have another one called the synthetic study method. In the synthetic study method, you are getting an overview of a particular scripture. What is this Bible telling us? Like when John wrote and said, But these were written that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and by believing we will have life through his name. So you have an overview. Generally speaking, what is this place saying? You read the book of Romans. Paul has something in mind for writing the book of Romans. Generally speaking, what is the book of Romans really trying to tell us on a general note? The next method is biographical study. Who is who? You are trying to know about someone. Try to pick out a character in the Bible and study about that person. Who is Abraham? You start from Genesis, you check, 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 check and get every information you can get from the Bible concerning Abraham. Other tools can also help you as we proceed. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is God? Who is the Holy Spirit? Who is John? Who is Peter? And who is Timothy? Praise the Lord. <laughs> you can as well study me if you like. Um, the study of me is Bishmolog anyway. So, that is biographical study. Biographical study, studying of the life of someone. Then the next one is um, testament study. Okay, this month I'm going to study the whole of the Old Testament and get an understanding of what he's saying. Or the whole of the New Testament and get an understanding of what he's saying. So that is what they call testament study. And finally, geographical study. This is where we learn all about the towns, the country, the nations that are mentioned in the Bible. What do you want to know about them? Their culture, their way of life. It will help you to understand the letter that are written to them and why it is written that way. When Paul said, I do not permit that women should speak in the church. Why did he say it there? And why did he somewhere else? That's when Paul will say that uh, some women are his partners in preaching the gospel. And why would it be that people like Priscilla and Aquila were heads of the church in their house? You see? So you see that in the, in, in the New, Testament, New Testament, the same Paul wrote and said that in Christ there is no male, there is no female. So how will he now say women should not preach in the church? Which church was he referring to? Why did he say that? What kind of culture do they have in that town that warrants such kind of speaking? By the time you do that study of that town, you begin to understand no wonder Paul said what he said when he was writing to this particular church. Don't just pick it up and generalize it and say, women should not preach. I have people tell me, I will not be in a church where women will preach. I can never. I can never. The truth is that you hate women. You hate women and you're looking for some scripture that will back you up to portray your hatred. Why didn't Jesus Christ have any woman among the 12 apostles? Why didn't Jesus Christ have any woman among the 12 apostles? That's your big question. What was the culture of the Jews and how did they regard women? Do the Jews regard women? But you see that the first person Jesus Christ made an apostle after he resurrected was a woman. Who is an apostle? An errand goer. Somebody who goes on an errand. Hallelujah. Someone who is sent on what? On an errand. That's apostle. And the woman who Jesus sent to go and talk to the men was Mary Magdalene. Go and tell my brothers. Go and tell them that I have risen. He was the first person that preached the good news. Not even a man. When Jesus Christ died, where were the men? All the men ran away. Who were those who were crying with him? Who were with him all to accept John? They were women. 
They were women. When God wanted to bring his son to the world, who did he use? Woman. So why do you think God hates women? God doesn't hate women. God used women to preach. God used women to teach. But some culture and tradition try to restrict the activities of women in the things of God. And sometimes, because of that, they are not cultured. They are not properly trained. So they cannot teach. Okay, let's say you're in a church where you have three men and one woman. The woman is well educated and understands scriptures properly, but the men don't know anything. You say because uh, they are men, they should come and talk. And let me tell you, when they say church in those days, it's not like our church today. So you have to be very careful when you are talking nonsense. Because <laughs> Praise the Lord. So geographical study will help you to understand the culture, the people, and understand why certain things were said the way they were said in the Bible. Before some people go there and begin to criticize the Bible anyhow, talk anything they like and say, eh, the Bible says uh, 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 God created Ken and Eben. Where did Cain get married to produce uh, children? Uh, who are those people that he said they will kill Cain? Because you don't know anything. And this, some people say I'm blunt. I'm not blunt. I'm telling the truth. <laughs> if you do thorough study like we have taught you today, you'll be able to understand what it means. There are many things about the Bible that you need to learn. And if you want to learn, you will learn. That's why we have Bible school. The Christ Bible Institute is a school that is to help you learn the scriptures the way it is without any bias. So enroll, join the college and learn. We have the regular school and we have the outreach school. What we have right now is the outreach school to help you get the general overview of certain things you need to know. Our outreach school is called the School of Christian Studies. Praise the Lord. So finally, what are the tools that will help you as you study? Number one is what we call Bible commentary. Bible commentary are a document that people have already done a research and found out certain things, most about this history and other things. They have written them down. They have made comments on some scriptures based on their understanding. You can learn one or two things from there. Another one is called concordance. This helps you to locate any word where they can be found in the Bible. Eh? I want to know where I can find salvation and study. I take my concordance and look for the word salvation. I will see everywhere salvation is mentioned in the Bible, I will know the verse and the chapters. Because the concordance arranged them. If you are using a concordance for King James, you will locate those words in King James. If you are using a concordance for NIV, you locate those words in the NIV. So it helps you for proper searching and to locate the chapters, verses, and anywhere you want to study easily in the Bible. We have Bible dictionary. I have them here. Bible dictionary, where you have you know, explanation of words that are used in the Bible. They are Greek meaning, they are, they are Hebrew meaning, and how it can be applied. Hallelujah. Now, now, somebody was asking me about uh, that Moses went to the mountain with uh, the elders and they ate and drank with God, the God of Israel. And then he said that uh, 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 nobody have ever seen God at any time. So what is the contradiction? I let the person know that the Bible is translated to us in English language. And most of the words that have been translated in English language may not give you the accurate meaning of what is being said. The word used as God in that place is Elohim. And Elohim is a plural word used for spirits, deities, God, angels, even demons. And now, to particularize it to Moses, we see that it was Moses, it was an angel that was assigned by God to reveal the law to Moses on the mountain, to appear to Moses on the burning, in the burning bush. Stephen confirmed it in the book of Acts. You see, so the person that they met and drank with, as it were, was an angel and not God himself. No one has seen God at any time. And when they see such thing, they are afraid that they will die. Remember when Gideon saw, is it Gideon or the, the Manoah, the father of Samson, and Gideon too? When they met an angel, they were so scared. They are afraid that they were going to die. He said, no, if you are going to die, who appear to you? So it was not God that they met on the mountain and ate and drank. You say eating and drinking. Abraham also met. And these are the tools you need for Bible study. Hallelujah. If you didn't get me, reverse and listen carefully and you will get me clearly. So today we have concluded our study on the ministry of the word. We have looked at how to, what the word of God means. 
We have looked at uh, what the scripture means, what is Bible study, how to prepare for Bible study, methods and tools for Bible study. If you need the materials, you can ask and we can send it to you. If you need the audio also, you can ask. If you want to join the platform for this class, you can also send us your name and your phone number and your WhatsApp number and we'll add you to the class platform where you can get all. It's also on the YouTube. You can also go there and uh, listen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the lecture tonight. We trust that everyone who have heard us are blessed by the word. We trust that the wisdom we have received tonight will help us in knowing ourselves and knowing you and knowing our world better so that we can live effectively in serving you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for the purpose of the world to bring salvation, healing, deliverance, and refreshment to be manifested in the life of everyone who has participated in the class tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, before we go, we always give our class offering. If you are there, it is to support the school. Wherever you are, the Lord touches you, and I know he's touching you. Make sure you don't just scroll out. Whatever offering you have, package it and send it to the number, the mobile number there. If you are not in Ghana, you want to send, just send, tell us, we'll tell you how to send your offering. You can send it to the Nigerian bank account that is there, uh, Ghana mobile number, number, or through word remit, you can always send an offering, and the Lord blesses you as you do that. Father, accept our offering we give to the glory of your name, in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for being with us tonight. We've ended our study on the ministry of the word. The next week, we're going to the ministry of prayer. We have two sessions for that one before we close. Uh, the session on uh, study five. God bless you and see you again next week. Bye-bye.